So, if you read the title of this video, you know what's up. I was able to interview the creator of Gravity Falls, Alex Hirsch. I am known online and through this YouTube channel as a Gravity Falls obsessive. I have videos dissecting the Gravity Falls timeline. I've looked at the show's writing, I've explored its themes, I've even done deep dives on the fandom's culture. I've done the research and I've taken the notes. And so you could imagine how daunting it was for me to sit down with the creator of Gravity Falls, Alex Hirsch, and ask him my most burning questions. The interview took place actually quite a long time ago, in summer of 2023. And it was a dream come true. I am so happy I'm able to finally share this with all of you. You have no idea how hard it was to keep this a secret. I think I have an ulcer now. I'm doing fine. As you watch this video, you might have a few questions, so I'm going to try to answer them right off the bat. When that GFN invited me into this interview, I knew I wanted to ask Alex really specific questions, things that he had never been asked before. As a result, a lot of the questions that you're going to get in this video and the companion video on that GFN's channel, more on that in a minute, they're about behind the scenes content, a lot of them are about specific lines in Journal 3, about hidden codes, hidden messages, things that a lot of casual Gravity Falls fans might not have any idea about. And that's why intermittently throughout this video, I'll pop in and give a little bit of context. There's no shame in not knowing absolutely everything about this show. That's why I'm here. Would you like to obsess over the minute details of a 2012 Disney cartoon? You're in the right place. As you watch this video, there might be questions that you anticipate us to ask Alex that we might not have asked or that might not be in this video. And I'm going to give a few reasons why right off the bat. Number one, those questions might have been asked in that GF fans video. Because this video had to be so heavily edited, more on that in a bit, we just actually split this video into two separate videos, one on my channel and one on that GF fans channel. My video has all the questions that I asked Alex, and that GFN's video has all the questions that he asked Alex. Because of this, there's no official part one, part two. You can watch either of our videos in any order, but you should definitely watch them both if you want to hear the entire interview. And if you don't want to watch two separate videos, the entire transcript to the Zoom call, or at least everything that we were able to include publicly, that transcript is in a link down below. I transcribed the entire three hour interview so that you could just read through it, search through it, and get all of those details in text. Another reason why the question you're thinking of might not be there is because he's already been asked it before. Like I said, we try to ask really specific questions, things that we know he hasn't been asked before, or at least hasn't publicly answered before. So as a result, it's possible that the question you're thinking of has been answered in a previous interview he's done or in the DVD commentary, or in a panel video, or in a stream. Down below, I've linked the Mystery of GF YouTube channel, which actually has a pretty extensive archive of a lot of these panels and streams, so you can check that out. Lastly, if there's a question that we asked that Alex chose not to answer publicly, we're not going to include it in our videos or in the transcript. And some of them were cut because he talked about secrets that I'm probably going to take to my grave. Again. I think I have an ulcer. <laughs> now, you might be wondering, wait, if this interview happened in summer of 2023, why is it only being released now? Well, you see, we sat down for this Zoom call with Alex Hirsch on July 15th, 2023. The SAG after strikes began on July 14th, 2023. Under strike rules, Alex wasn't really able to give media interviews, and so we held off on releasing this until we were able to. On top of that, Alex Hirsch also needed to review the transcript of the answers that he gave to make sure that there weren't any details on projects that he did not want out in the public. So as a result, like I said before, this interview was pretty heavily edited. All of these reasons combined are why we are only releasing it now. How this interview was so early that one of the questions I asked him was actually about the strike. I'm not going to put the answer to that question in this video because it's not really relevant anymore now that the strike is over, but it's in the transcript below, so if you want to read it, knock yourself out. Another thing I need to share is because of the issues with the strike, there's actually no footage to this. 
Because of the rules with the strike, where you're not able to give media interviews, we weren't really decided yet if it was going to be a footage interview, an audio interview, or a transcribed interview. And I think Alex expected it to be a transcribed interview, so he wasn't really camera ready when we did the Zoom call. Because of that, he asked us not to use the footage, and so we tried to be a bit creative with the visuals that we used for this interview, but we were able to use the audio. So you're gonna be able to hear the Zoom call audio. But I didn't want this video to be boring to look at. I mean, it's one thing if you're just gonna be listening to it, but if you're actually watching this video, I wanted it to be, you know, visually compelling. And so, I made puppets. And if you're thinking, wow, that sure is a lot of unnecessary work to put into a video just for a bit. Hello! <laughs> nice to see you! How are you doing? Hey, I'm, I'm doing good. Uh, nice, nice to see you both. Um, if you can remind me, what are your actual names? I know yeah, sure. we're in internet realm yeah. here. We're using right. internet lingo. I'm <laughs> Hannah. I have the YouTube channel, Hannah Hyperfixage. Mm -hmm. So far, just has YouTube video essays about <laughs> Gravity Falls. Um, so, yep. yeah, and, nice um, to meet you. <laughs> and uh and uh and uh my name is uh, uh hk um i i run the uh, dad jeff and youtube channel which um i've been doing this since like 2017 so i've recently gotten to more like essay type videos but like i've been around for a while yeah Anna, who are you uh, uh, i'm Seuss. um i'm the new manager of the mystery shack uh Hi. i've engaged to melody um uh, i believe <laughs> bless the union so we're looking I'm forward passing. to wedding in august uh, nice to meet you. both of you. Thank you for bearing with our um, fan <laughs> gushing from both of us. Uh, oh, we'll keep it to a minute. I've experienced so much fan gushing. I I, I understand the fan <laughs> gushing. I've been the giver of fan gushing to people. Okay. I'm a fan, and no, I I'm I'm you. We're the same. There's no <laughs> yes. here. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, uh, most of my questions are going to be about Journal Three, um, because I have a problem uh, <laughs> uh and i know that rob renzetti worked on a lot of it and that you know you guys worked in coordination so if there's something you don't know the answer to or something that you know you know something that maybe he would know the answer let me know um and that's fine um so an easy one off the bat were there any journal three excerpts or encrypted entries that you wanted to include but ultimately couldn't a good question um i know that we we did cut like 12 pages out of the journal just due to length um because me and rob were both <laughs> writing right uh you know we we decided to collaborate on this book and rob is great because rob mm -hmm. is sort of like <laughs> when him and i are together we're very much like grunkle stan and and ford and he is ford <laughs> and i stan. um but you know we both were kind of writing our sections separately and then I would then he would give me his sections and I do my sort of Gravity Falls flavor pass where I try to sort of pull it towards making sure that it feels like it's in character. Um, but because we were writing separately, we both I think we both took a pass at certain scenes that were redundant and both of us like added pages. And then we just we discovered that there was like publishing came back and was like, yeah, there's like six spreads or seven spreads that you have to choose. You have to kill some. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was just like unused episode ideas. Like there was lots of episode ideas where you'd come up with in the room we would have uh, a wall that was all like mm -hmm. cards of just like genre areas we wanted to tackle oh we want to do an episode that's kind of like the thing we want to do a time travel episode and then on the other wall they would just be like character beats like oh wouldn't it be cool if uh grunkle stan's old pal came to town uh, wouldn't it be interesting if um dipper had a had a fan for once um <laughs> and would try to take one from one wall and one from the other wall and try to mesh them into one cohesive whole, but often they wouldn't click. So you'd have a fun monster, but no emotional story to attach it to, or a fun emotional story, but no monster to attach it to. And so we had lots of scraps on the cutting room floor. So right. when you're writing something like Journal 3 or Lost Legends, a lot of it is just sort of like, oh, here's an idea we had that didn't have enough legs for an episode, but fits as a fun little chapter. Um, I remember Rob had done, <laughs> Rob did one where it was like, Dipper and Mabel were going door to door selling grunkle stand bobblehead oh. like he was selling right. he was sending them around town like you gotta move this merch no one's buying it and and somehow <laughs> different mabel wound up there was some like old lady in gravity falls right on a doll collector and like trapped Dipper and Mabel in her doll collection. And they were like inside, like, you know, the boxes that American girl dolls are in like <laughs> strings, 
get out. Like uh, th- oh, I remember wow. that, that, that story made it in. There was a lot of little things like that where they were almost like, um, like, are you afraid of the dark? Like sort of like spooky vignette type, like little moments. Mm-hmm. I, I don't recall right. any dramatic, uh, uh, meaningful canon that was cut out of the book. Like we tried to keep the stuff that was most relevant to the series <laughs> and, and the things that were kind of side adventures. Those got more and more pared mm-hmm. down, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Right. Do you still have those pages? I mean, Rob does. I'm I'm Ooh. sure I'm sure Rob has some of those pages left. Oh my gosh. I'll just say what you were saying about like you being the sad and, <laughs> and him being the porn. I've I've talked about this with my friends. I listen to those DVD commentaries a lot because I make mm-hmm. stupidly long two hour in-depth video essays about Grand Falls. <laughs> and uh I, you know, so I retained a lot of it and I've listened to them again and again. <laughs> And when Rob talks about Stanford Pines, I think this man gets, he understands Ford the same way I do. (laughs) Like there was this one instance in the DVD commentary, if I could go on a small tangent, um, (laughs) where you're talking about the infinity side of dying. Um, and how he puts it in his cheap plastic case. And you go, I'm not so sure about that joke. It feels like, you know, he's more practical than this. Like he wouldn't just put it in a cheap plastic, cheap plastic case. He's really responsible. And then Rob's like, no, he absolutely would. It's great character building. And I'm like, yeah, he would. (laughs) Well, no, it's it's, it's what's fascinating is seeing sort of your perception of this because from, from, and I understand this because I'm a fan too. Yeah. As a fan of media, I connect with the media. I have a personal mm-hmm. connection with the media. Yeah. And so personal that I'm like, this character is actually kind of like, kind of me and kind of my friend. And I have I have a wavelength about this character in my head. And therefore, I, I when I hear a false note, when somebody says something about this character that doesn't seem right to me, it's like, it's like I'm getting insulted. Like, how dare you? Um, right, the exactly. funny thing is, from within the world of sort of this creation, it's, yeah. It's a, it's so um, it's so improvisational when we're creating. Yeah. It's so riffing on each other and discovering something. So, in our world, we we still recall the inventing of this thing, yes. and so the final version that you, you've only experienced the final version. You know, I still recall when Ford had a long beard <laughs> and was a hippie. There was a right. version of Ford that was completely different. And I recall Ford when we wanted to get Jeff Bridges to the, do the voice. And we couldn't get Jeff Bridges. We were oh thinking maybe he was going to be kind of, kind of more like this kind of Zen kind of guy. The Grunkle Stan was so <laughs> aggro. Um, and we couldn't. Get, and so we were we were hunting for this thing. And I remember us talking about maybe J.K. Simmons and then thinking, gosh, you know, uh, he's got a very familiar voice. Is it going to feel oh, is he going to feel like too overexposed? And then, oh, geez, you know, I'm I'm 27 doing Grunkle Stan and J.K. Simmons is his own age. Are these voices even going to be believable? <laughs> others? So it's like we're putting this character together. We're putting blocks together and then removing blocks then putting them up. Yeah. And it, it's only at the last second that a ford is revealed that we're like i guess <laughs> that's it um and then once we have that then we're like okay let's let's sand off the edges let's figure it out let's move this around maybe he looks yeah. like this maybe his hair looks like that let's make his sweater red so it evokes the journal okay let's how do we make him look like stan but not not like stan oh geez our original versions of him from a flashback don't match well it doesn't matter <laughs> we're gonna change that because we like this yeah. design better. um so we're, you know, we're figuring all that stuff out right yeah. um, right Here's the thing. When I think about what you just said about me and Rob, it's so funny because <laughs> what to you comes across as, oh, Rob understands Ford's um, ridiculous recklessness, to me comes across as <laughs> Rob is Ford and <laughs> Ford does rationalize. That's what he does. If, yeah. if like that's his one of Ford's greatest powers is rationalizing. So mm-hmm. you're watching Rob as Ford rationalize Ford's bad decision. It's <laughs> so it's like it, it is it is Rob being Ford in that <laughs> moment. But it's it's like I think what's being revealed is less Ford's recklessness and more Ford's ability to justify anything. Um, no, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, like it's like in the journal when he's like, "Oh man, yeah, I'm stealing government waste, but like <laughs> I'm doing a public service. It's fine." <laughs> is there anything that you think hasn't aged particularly well about Gravity Falls that um, that you might go back and change if you were making it again today? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, here's the thing is like uh, me and the crew that I work with, we really care about what we make. Um, and mm -hmm. so we're all perfectionists. Um, and, you know, I would have the hour after I locked picture on any episode, I would have said, oh, shit, there's things I want to go back and change. You know, yeah. so I, I, I was I was dissatisfied with it as I was making it, let alone 10 years later, you know, every little thing that I that I have a problem with growing and growing. So, I mean, you know, I, I think. Um, I think that there's, it's impossible as a viewer to understand the difference between, to understand the gulf between content and intent because you're only receiving content. I will say, I'm surprised that the answer I didn't immediately get was Grenda. I feel like <laughs> oh. Grenda, like, at least among my friends, uh, I mean, there's a lot of love for Grenda, obviously. Like, we all love her. We understand that um, it was intended more as like a commentary on puberty. Um, but like friends uh, you know uh, most of my friends are trans i'm just gonna say it and, and like the the joke about her voice changing it it some of it doesn't yeah i don't want to be me because you're like you made this thing i care a lot about but it can come across as like a transphobic joke uh well, that, that, and, I, think that's, I think that's a yeah. perfect example of what i was saying about content and in, intent and content right yeah but like yeah the origin of Grenda was um, we were writing a uh, double dipper and yeah. we realized, oh, it would be cool if Mabel made some friends in town. I had worked with um, two actors, uh, uh, um, Carl Ferullo and Nikki Yang, uh, who shared a cubicle um, outside mm -hmm. my office who were always arguing about things because they just had such different personalities. Carl had such a big personality and, and Nikki was, she was very sly. And it, so, it somehow the idea was like, oh, what if Mabel's friends are just N Nikki and Carl because they have a fun rapport. Um, and so I was like, oh, great. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a friend shaped hole in the script. N Nikki and Carl are Mabel's friends. Um, and then, you know, that, that decision, which is sort of made in haste as like, a, oh, we love these two and we know that they are funny and fun. And it, you're hundred percent right to watch that and say like, this is not on the level uh, with a conversation about, um, yeah. you know, about gender. A hundred percent. Yes. It, yeah. it was a blind spot. We weren't looking there. If I was inventing Gravity Falls from scratch now in a million years, uh, I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have cast, um, you know, Carl in that role, um, you know, but it, it's it's one of those it's one of those things where like uh, I. I believe that when it comes to media, the customer is always right. So when you the customer says like this, this was experienced by me as something that was insensitive and hurtful. I'm like, you're right. Like we fucked up. <laughs> like, and when <laughs> yeah, I tell you, I am right. Panic, I'll I'll also say, just because I'm I'm not every trans person, I know personally trans women who love Brenda and who think that, like, you know, that really resonate with the character. But I also know trans women who watch it and feel, like, a lot of discomfort with it. So, yeah. you know, the trans community is not a monolith. Uh, but, yeah, I know what I was watching. I was like, Ugh. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sorry you experienced it that way. I, I'm I'm sorry that we we failed you as an audience. You know, I'm 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 glad that we were able to deliver in so many other ways. But you know, that was a uh, as as the chef serving the meal, you come back and say, "What the hell is this?" In the, in the cake. <laughs> You're right. We there's some up. transphobia in this. Yeah, there's, little, there's, there's, a, there's ignorance. There's a little bit of ignorance. Inside, inside my soup and I'm like oh you're absolutely right I'm so sorry I, I wish I could go back to the kitchen and get you a soup uh, that was different I can guarantee you that you wouldn't see something like that from me um you know ever in anything I'm making again um mm -hmm. you know. so this is the first bit of a deep cut information I'm gonna try to give in this video uh if you're a casual fan you might not have any idea what I'm talking about but there was a single line that was changed in journal three between editions of the book I'm not talking about the special edition and the normal edition. That has a million changes, but they're all in blacklight ink. I'm talking about a single line that was changed in Ford's handwriting on a page for seemingly no good reason. The change happens on what I call the bean page. On this page, in the first edition of this book, the one that came out with a ribbon bookmark, mind you, a bookmark that isn't available in the current edition of Journal 3, Ford says that he confides in Fiddleford that he is happy to no longer be traveling the path that he's on alone. The line was changed somewhere between the first edition and around the time that the special edition was released. And it now says 
I confided in Fiddleford that I was grateful to be traveling it with a friend. I actually tweeted Rob Renzetti about this change, um, like years ago. And Rob said that he had no idea that the change had taken place and he wasn't sure that Alex had either. But no one had actually asked Alex about the line change. And considering it's the only line that was changed in the journal outside of fixing a few typos here or there, um, I really wanted to ask Alex about it. Especially because there's kind of been an online conspiracy that the line was changed because Disney Publishing wanted to make it seem less ambiguous. The first version of the line implies that Ford isn't alone anymore. He has Fiddleford there. I mean, it could mean that he cares about Fiddleford as a friend, as more than a friend. But the new edition specifically says, with a friend. And so, this is what I asked Alex. Right. So, I'm going to go back to Journal 3 because <laughs> I have a million questions. And I know that we're probably going to run out of time before I get through them all, so I'm going to speed run these. So... I've always told myself that the one question I would ask you if I ever met you, uh, like if I ever went to a convention, would be about, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> here we are. I'm losing my mind. Honestly. You're welcome, Hannah. Um, oh my God. This is so fucking surreal. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so there was a line change in Journal 3. So hmm. the b between like the first print that had like a handful of typos and stuff and the second print, like right before the Blacklight edition or around that time, there was a change in one line, like completely different. The first version of the line, and this is on the page where Ford and Philford are, they're camping out and they're talking about like their dreams and aspirations. And Philford's like, why don't you settle down? And Ford's like, I don't know, man, I'm married to science. He, he He's just like, you know, but I, I really care about this. And um, he specifically says, um, I have both copies next to me because I'm like this. Um, <laughs> Uh, it hadn't been an easy path, but I prefer the road less traveled anyway. Although I confided in F that I was grateful to no longer be traveling alone. That line was changed to, I am happy to be traveling this with a friend. Like, specifically with a friend. Um, oh. Many, like, in the fandom saw this as an attempt by Disney Publishing to emphasize Ford and Biddleford's relationship as, like, strictly platonic and remove any room for queer interpretation one second so I'm, 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 I'm pulling it up uh, all right sounds good yeah it's on the page with the can of beans like I right guess we all have our journal trees here oh yeah i i have three copies next to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah um i mean i'll be 100 percent transparent about this i was not even aware yeah i tweeted like, rob renzetti and you about it like two years ago and, but rob said uh, uh, i didn't know about this and i doubt alex did too but I guess my question is, you know, one, does this align change you knew about, which you just answered? And two, do you have any thoughts on why this change took place and the fandom response? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, like, my guess would be that, like, Disney never, they never try to sneak stuff by me. Like, they okay. know that I am a detail-oriented <laughs> bastard. And, like, it, the sneaking stuff by pipeline only goes one way and it's not executive yeah. to me <laughs> you know what i mean uh -huh. um, so like uh my only guess would be that like we change lots of stuff at every stage uh -huh. for every reason constantly so it's like this book had lots and lots of drafts and things were constantly moving around just for uh for flow for grammar yeah. for paragraph or we add an mm -hmm. illustration and now there's less room so like everything was always changing and it was always very organic. And I sincerely believe in this instance that it probably was a, like one of those changes that did not have any like um, authorial intent behind it. it was just like part of lots of stuff shifting. And for whatever reason, that was one that yeah. made it a difference between multiple. Were you saying that it was, is there an addition of journal three with that like, change? In like, if you buy Journal 3, this is the ver version that you pre-ordered. Like, uh -huh. this is, like, like I pre-ordered it once in advance, like everyone yeah. else. Like, this is the first version. It's the one with yeah. the shitty binding. Um, <laughs> You know, they changed yeah. the binding. They fixed and so a bunch in, of typos. In that version, that it had that line, but then in subsequent versions, it was different? Yes. in subsequent versions, it is different. In subsequent, right. This is the one with my, sorry about all the posts. Oh, uh, yeah. this, is, uh, this is my research journal. It says, I confided in an F that I was grateful to be traveling it with a friend. It's, would... it's the only line by the way aside from typos that has any difference 
It is are, the only wine that has changed. Are you sure about that? I am. I, I, I hate to be like, I am so positive, but you don't understand. I went through line by line. <laughs> well, I, and I, I saw all the sticky notes. So if anyone would <laughs> yeah. be sure, it would be you. I mean, yeah. I honestly, like 100%, like hand on my heart, hand to God. I've never heard of that. I've never been aware of it. And my assumption based on my experience with the company uh -huh. is they are, they're not detail oriented. Like, like they're not like us, like, like, yeah. I don't know. There was a gravity falls book released where they literally had yeah. quick time player bar. <laughs> we know. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> what, what, what I'm saying is like, yeah. instead of being a lot of like hyper concerned detail oriented people with an agenda that are focusing and trying to change stuff with an intent, they tend to be overworked, distracted and focusing on Marvel. And like, <laughs> I truly believe that that change was probably one of like a hundred changes between different variations. Like, I believe, I truly believe hearing that, that this was a like random mistake that happened to accidentally exist on a fault line of like looking like it has intent about these characters. Uh -huh. Oh, um, well, it does look like it. I'm straight up about every time they've given me shit. Like, you know that I don't <laughs> oh, that I know. Yeah. about right. Disney it's, stuff. So like, yeah, I, I do believe that that was a mistake. Cause like, here's the, this is the other thing is like, not only are they not detail oriented, they don't understand the characters and they don't care. Like, I yeah. don't think it would ever occur to them. You know, I, I will say it like even the initial interpretation of it, that I'm happy to no longer be traveling this path alone. Isn't inherently queer, but by censoring it if it was censorship then they've immediately called attention to it and it oh, made everyone go yeah, oh, exactly wait, were they gay <laughs> and, and it's it's like the streisand effect in a way exactly you know? the textbook yeah. perfect I streisand. Guess, if, if i had to guess because these types of when you're editing when you're writing and then you reread your yeah. writing and you edit it and then you reread your writing and you edit it there's a very yeah. subconscious process of like streamlining and sort of um literally making paragraphs look nice it's entirely possible that me or Rob made that change out of one of a million changes specifically because we knew psychologically that Ford is not traveling this path alone. He's traveling it with his muse who he has a very complex and fucked up relationship with. And even yeah. in Ford's private thoughts, he would not say, I'm alone. He would say, oh, I, I have a very important relationship in my life with Bill, but I don't have a friend. Um, like, Fascinating. like that, that is okay. a different or is not alone in his mind, even though he is extraordinarily alone. Um, yes. and that I feel like that may have been the intent if there was an intent. So, fascinating. Right. So, many who purchased the Black Light edition, including myself, um, uh, or actually, I had a friend buy it for me because it was too expensive. Um, but, um, who have this Black Light edition thought it would be more likely to contain like dark and grim like material related to Ford's psychological breakdown um or at least more mature compared to the journal's intended seven plus eight audience like in a way that 150 dollar uh price tag is almost like a child block if you think about it like <laughs> parents aren't gonna buy a 150 dollar book for their kids probably not um <laughs> Were there any bits of info or material that you wanted to incorporate into the Blacklight layout that you were barred from uh, including? Was there ever an intention to include more grim material in the Blacklight edition? Not really, just because when, you know, I, I'd been pitching, consumer products asked us if we had any interest in making Gravity Falls stuff. And we said when we were, you know, working on the show, yeah, 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 Journal 3, Journal 3, Journal 3, and it should have black yeah. lights and it all the things. And they said, no, we're never going to do that. And then... <laughs> Just as the show was starting to end and they were realizing how popular it was, they said, we want to do a Journal 3. And I was like, oh, great. Can I, can I have black lights? Can I have all these messages? They're like, no, we're not going to be able to afford that. And then finally, when Journal 3 was a bestseller, they said, you know what? We you can do what you want. <laughs> doing the black light edition. And I said, oh, finally. Okay, well, <laughs> here's my dream then. I want it to have, I want it to have the monocle and I want it to have a... Uh, uh, you know, a, a more realistic, robust, um, you know, cover. And I want it to have all the, the, you should be able to remove the, 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 the things that are taped in and there should be writing behind and, and all the black light messages should be in it. And I want black lights on every single page. And they said like, yeah, we can afford to have like 40 black light pages. In <laughs> um, the, the, the paste is very expensive. And I said, oh, great. But my intent was that this would now be the journal three. Like I, yeah. I wasn't trying to create a, targeted special edition i was trying to create like the 
like director's cut and I wanted this to be the book everywhere. And I, I had no idea that it was going to be so damn expensive until after the book was so like, I was creating it for the same audience. Like right. I wasn't intending it for like older people or collectors or anything. I was thinking I, I want, and I really wanted to, I imagined in my mind, like parents and kids, like, turning out the lights and and making it glow to like a cool memory in the kids okay. minds um like so i i had that image in my mind because i i think i had some i remember having like glow in the dark toys as a kid and like running out holding them to the lamp right. and running out the closet and, and closing lights and then like oh wow that looks so cool um and so it wasn't until we had made all the material that disney came back and said like okay great it's 150 dollars <laughs> and only make uh uh, uh five thousand it was originally going to be 5,000. They said, we're only making 5,000 uh, ver- uh, copies of it. And it's, it's 150 bucks. And I was like, I was really bummed out. I was like, well, first of all, that's way too expensive. I now feel terrible that uh, we're charging that for, for a product. Um, and I, I felt so bad about it that I, I was like, ah, how do I make this thing more valuable? Even though it's all too late, I've already written it. I was like, I'll sign every single one. <laughs> Um, cause maybe that'll make it feel more valuable. Like I felt bad charging so much. And then when they learned that I would sign every single one, they're like, you know what, we'll do 10,000. Will you sign 10,000? And I had already agreed. So I, I had three days in a row where it was me with headphones and bottled I water see. and people just passing me and me signing and passing and like, <laughs> and got cramped up. Um, and, uh, it, it, but like, yeah, so th- there wasn't, there was never an intent for that version to be like, like uh-huh. the age lock, like, oh, it's right. only- uh-huh. <laughs> it was supposed to be for everyone and then it just turned out it was too pricey um, fascinating just, wow. yeah because like because he only started using black like ink while he was in the throes of his paranoia so a lot of people right. were like oh we're gonna get the really fucked up stuff let's go <laughs> and it was like oh how to get the skin off a platypus i mean that's fine i don't i'm not mad at it it's a great page <laughs> like all right i guess this is what he thinks about when he's sleep deprived <laughs> it was, it was, it was very fun though i love well, it i'll say that when it comes to here's here's one of the this is a complicated thing to say but here's one of the differences between gravity falls um what i would refer to in my mind as expanded narrative um which is things that are uh exist orbiting the series as a canon um but expanding and and hopefully enriching and giving new little bits of spice to that canon is that Gravity Falls is one of the rare shows cut in its prime that was cut down by the creator and not by the company, <laughs> which means uh-huh. that Disney is always hungry for more Gravity Falls stuff, which means yeah. that when I'm looking at creating expansions of the narrative, I always have to keep an eye on if I ever wanted to do something with this show more in a in a animated context, I want to make sure that I'm keeping certain material for that. So for example, right. with Legends, it's like, if I'm going to do some adventures with Stan and Ford, either they need their own book or their own miniseries. And and I I could probably, you know, talk Disney into a miniseries if I was out of my Netflix deal and I really wanted to. Um, and okay. so th- there is some, there are sometimes things where, like, you're sort of intentionally kneecapping some of the narrative conversation and some of these things you're not expanding it too far outside of what's known because that might be juicy fuel for stuff that could happen in the future right Uh, so like there are certain things like that where it's like would this be better (laughs) served in a different format might i hold on to it Uh, that's sometimes that's sometimes on the back of my mind i know that's frustrating because if you're a fan you're saying we'll make the mini series yeah i get it though so I need to talk to you about the red rectangles because I'm losing my goddamn mind. Throughout the edges of Journal 3, you can see a series of red rectangles around the border. Sometimes the patterns that the red rectangles are in repeat. Sometimes so specifically that you can even tell the individual line strokes in a rectangle are repeated from one rectangle to another. These weren't just hand-drawn rectangles drawn on every single page. No, no, no. They seemed to have a rectangle PNG that they put on each page. And these rectangles are just... They seemed too perfect to not mean anything. When going through the journal, I actually identified about 25 different patterns. And you know, the thing about there being 25 patterns that I could maybe glean apart 
is that 25 is almost 26, and there's 26 letters in the alphabet, so maybe the rectangles represent different letters of the alphabet. But that isn't all I tried. Someone suggested to me that the rectangles might look like spectrographs. Spectrographs are the spectrum of light that you get from different elements on the periodic table. So if a pattern of rectangles kind of matches um, a pattern from a spectrograph of a specific element, I could take the element symbol, I could take those letters, and maybe if I write down all those letters, I can get a code, and then I just need to decode it. What could the password be? It's probably a key. I mean, on this one page, it says that the code is the word Emmerich? I don't know what that means. Maybe that's a visioneer cipher. Maybe that's what I need to solve the rectangles. <sighs> Listen. At the end of the day, I tried all of these things and more. I've been obsessing over these red rectangles for several years, and I couldn't get anything to work. If it does mean something, I don't know. <laughs> so I asked Alex Hirsch. So this is a question that I, I need to ask because mm -hmm. I have, as you saw my post you know I'm you know I have a problem. Um, <laughs> oh, the post yeah, yeah. I, yeah, so... I have taken close-up photos of those instances of the red rectangles on the outskirts of the pages, and I've compared them, and I've looked at them, and I, I like, showed the, the sequences because some sequences repeat and some don't quite repeat, and you could tell it's, like, the same rectangles because the line width is the same on some of these, but not on the other ones. Some of them look like they were drawn, like, differently. And I've like shown them to a friend of mine who's like a linguist, like like they majored in linguistics. And I was like, does this look like like it could be a code or something? And they're like, it kind of looks like it echoes like patterns of language. It could. I don't know. I'm not a Gravity Falls fan. I don't know what this means. I and and it's okay if it doesn't mean anything. But before I spend more years of my life looking into this, please tell me. You don't even gotta tell me what they mean, but do the rectangles mean anything? Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Do you actually want to know? Yeah, I want to know. Well, <laughs> I want to know if they mean something. Oh, man, does that mean they I mean, don't? <laughs> you know what this is? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. This is missing no right here. Let me explain the thing with missing no. Uh, in a question that that GFN asked, go over to that video to get that answer. Seriously, I'm trying to send people over there because it's only fair. You got to watch both of these videos. But on that channel, Alex describes his experience of asking the creator of Pokemon about Missing No from Pokemon Red Blue and how he had a long time obsession with the mystery of Missing No only to realize that it was just a glitch. So... Yeah, when he held up his missing no plush during the interview, I knew what answer I was about to get. I do want to know though because I, 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 I look at this pretty often, and I sunk a lot of time into it, and and I, I, I'll, I'll keep it out of, I'll, I'll do it we, off the record if you don't yeah, want it public knowledge. We can love the fandom their eyes for the rest of your lives. Yeah. Sometimes the mystery is more interesting than the truth. Um, you know, uh, in, 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 to my knowledge, to my knowledge, yeah. I gave you an opportunity to keep yeah, the mystery fine. Fine. forever, but uh, you, chose, you chose not to keep the mystery. So You're chosen to my knowledge, our illustrator, Andy, who created those to my knowledge, they're just, they're just symbols. They're just squares. Now here's the that. Thing. Okay. <laughs> Andy, Andy is one clever. And there's a chance that he's hidden a code in there that I've never seen. Uh, one of our artists um, in Seuss and the Real Girl, uh, Paul mm -hmm. Robertson, who did the sprite art, he hid a binary code in that episode that I didn't even know about. The, oh, wow. On the, he, he hid the word Space Jam 2 on one of the laptops in the background, accidentally manifesting Space Jam 2 into reality 10 years later. <laughs> but, you know, that I literally didn't even know about that. That's something that an artist snuck in. So if there were secrets in the squares, they would be secrets known only to Andy. But okay. I, don't think, <laughs> uh, okay. I don't think that he would have done that um, just because he never has before. Um, there are occasionally there will be like a weird occasionally there will be like a gag in one of those journals in in a symbol or something that Andy did put in. That's just like a goofy joke where people are like, this joke doesn't seem in character. I'm like, ah, oh, Andy. <laughs> You know, to my knowledge, those squares. Now, here's the thing. I wish they were. 
you know, like yeah. looking right. back, I'm like, oh, that would be so cool. Cause like when we did the cipher hunt, our, yeah. we tried to make the final code as hard as we could. And, and Ian, the, the, our art director, he did the final code of the cipher hunt, which was like, I don't even understand how it worked where there's these trees with branches and branches that had a knot and a branch on the left side equaled certain letters. There was a way to extract an alphabet from these branches that I genuinely didn't understand. Like you can hide something completely pictorially in a way that does not reveal that it that that it has a Rosetta Stone to it. So it is possible to make something okay. that All right. complex. Um, but to my knowledge, but here's All the right. thing, that's, that's what's so frustrating about these types of conversations is like, I'm a- I'm a It's I'm okay, a, I, I, I'm okay. I'm glad I know, to be honest. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an entertainer and I wanna give I want to give value and it's okay. it's a bummer to be to say like hey, there's no there's no value there yeah. which there was you know no I, you get it okay so the red rectangles don't mean anything at least according to alex but it's fine i'm okay i'm i'm doing great actually but what about the symbols on the portal schematic page you see we have these symbols in journal 3 13 of them that appear in a half circle and if this is half a circle then that means that the full circle would be a full 26 letters don't you think and normally I might think that they're just random symbols, but occasionally these symbols actually show up in the journal. For example, on the page with the sailboat by the lake, we see a bunch of these symbols over here. And seemingly they don't mean anything, but a couple of these symbols actually show up on the freaking portal schematics page. So that needs to mean something, right? Like, they're letters, they mean something, right? <laughs> I I will say in that vein, while while you're while you're crushing my dreams, that's a joke. <laughs> I, I really am happy to know. So there's so on the portal schematics page, right? Uh -huh. All right. So I, I by the way, I know there's a lot of fake blood on this. That's for one of my YouTube videos. Ignore that. Um, <laughs> it, 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 pretend you don't see that. Um, it's it's fake. Um, <laughs> so you have this half circle here, right, with all these symbols, and uh -huh. there's thirteen of them, which means if it was a full circle it would be 26. Uh -huh. And I just want to confirm that that is also an accident <laughs> and not meaningful, unless it is. Um, I, this was, this was something, yeah, I, those weren't part of our journal code. So yeah, I mean, uh -huh. that's something created by Andy. Um, All right, and good to know. That's right. meaning, I don't know the meaning. <laughs> I'll, bo I'll bother right. Andy about it. Saying, oh, <laughs> well, you, you have said though, in interviews that there are parts of journal three that have not yet been solved by fans. Uh, and if, if there's something you're thinking of, can you give any hints as to what that is? I'm trying to remember. I just remember like when the journal came out, like yeah. I kept my eye on, like, I was like, I, I popped into Tumblr a few times and stuff. And I was just like, okay, let's see. Let's see. Cause often people would do like a yeah. master post of here's every code. Mm -hmm. And I saw a couple of master posts that yeah. were missing. Some. Um, mm -hmm. I don't remember off the top of my head what they may have been. Um, okay. I don't think they were anything particularly um, dark or meaningful. I think they were probably just more color and texture and, and jokes and stuff. But I do All recall right. seeing master posts that were incomplete. Um, uh, okay. I, 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 so I have a I, I have a hunch. But again, looking at your journal, I, I doubt there's anything in there you haven't found. If you have <laughs> gone to the squares, you've probably found every single thing that's in there. You've <laughs> okay. Every yeah. All right. Out of it. All right. Thank you very right, much. No. I, I I will say this this is it's been a lot of effort, but I am glad to know so I could um have more. Put that story to rest. <laughs> Mystery solving. Yay! I have a couple of quick ones about about Fiddleford. Um, what contributed to, I guess, like the story decision in the journal to have Fiddleford create the memory gun after a Grimblovin attack? instead of after the portal incident, because a lot of people were surprised by that. It seemed almost like a retcon, but not quite, like it barely fits, but it very much implies like when he's doing like test number one, Fiddleford, and you see the chart behind him of the um, of the probability of failure in the series that he started making the memory gun after the portal incident. But in the series, he's already made it and he's used it several times <laughs> before the portal incident. Um. Yeah, sorry. I, I think you definitely have a much uh, a greater handle on the timeline of the book than I do. <laughs> when when in the book, so you're saying he he uses it after the Grim Loblin incident. He invents it after the Grim Loblin incident. After the Grim Loblin incident, he has such horrible anxiety. And then like, you know, he he's down for the count. And then he comes back the next day when Ford's like, hey, you know, we solve problems with our intellect. Then McGuckett's like, I have an idea. 
memory gun and he shows up with the memory gun and Ford's like right. yes this is an awful idea what the fuck <laughs> um, <laughs> yes that's right okay yeah, yeah yeah I mean I think um and it's, it's been a minute I, I forgive me you're, you're so steeped in the timeline and and it's, it's as, you, as right. you know having investigated it it's clearly yeah. not something we put our yeah. greatest focus on it's um, fine I think um you know my, my hunch is that the thought there was my hunch is that the thought there was that in, in our ment- in our canon, Ford and McGucket had a huge falling out after the portal test. But that was the bridge yeah. to far. that's what broke their friendship. And the things that um or the, uh, McGucket walked out that door and he did not come back. Yeah. The things that Ford said as McGucket left weren't "I value you" and "I'm sorry we have a difference of opinion." It was "Get the hell out of here, you hillbilly! You don't understand science." You know, it was he was he was really um uh he he was cruel to McGucket. Um, you know, he was cold to him, and and they they did not. They, they did not talk, um, you know, for 30 more years after that. And so I think the thought was, I we were interested in the psychology that resulted in McGucket creating the memory gun. But we knew that if McGucket created the memory gun after their breakup, um, there could be no reference to it in the journal. There, there, there could be no explanation of it in the journal because McGucket wouldn't be around and Ford yeah. wouldn't know. Um, and so the feeling was the only way that we can learn about this is if it's invented before then. Um, and that way we can see McGucket's kind of innocent, naive thought of like, oh, this is a, M- McGucket is increasingly having anxiety problems as he were before. <laughs> yeah. And these anxiety problems are actually not problems. They're uh, him being right about what they're doing. Um, they're, they're, and, and he so wants to please Ford and he so wants to be um, the, I think McGucket sees his own value as I'm the guy who builds stuff and you're the idea guy and I'm the guy who builds stuff and I'm valuable to you when I'm building stuff. And when I have a problem, I can build a solution. And anytime there's an emotional issue, you build your way out. And so I thought, oh, we can, we can show that intuition here in the journal. And that felt of the things that could be happening here, that felt more rich and revealing than to not reference the memory gun. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, so the canon became McGucket proposed such a thing early, early on, um, and then was told that's you shouldn't do that. And then, mm-hmm. like um, you know, like like an addict, like an alcoholic who has a little sip and notices it takes the edge off. Um, you know, privately he he can't bear to say to 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 Ford that that this is he's keeping a lot from Ford. He's keeping just how scared he is of what they're doing. He's keeping just how concerned he is. And McGucket doesn't really know what's going on, but but he's internalizing and thinking like, I just need to be a better partner. Um, if I have anxiety, I'm going to pop anxiety pills and I'm going to get through this, you know? Right. Um, so like, it felt like, okay, there's an opportunity to see that in McGucket. Um, and, and so I think that was the intention of putting that there. Right. In the same vein of McGucket, was there ever another version of the Bill Ford and Ford reunion? Because they had their reunion in Weird McGinnon. Was there ever another version of that, like, planned or on the cutting room floor um, aside from that one? Like, did you ever consider maybe the meeting up before the finale? Um, I mean, it was just one of those things where, you know, we threw a bunch of balls up in the air, and then we had to catch them all at the very end. I see. We knew oh, we okay. couldn't catch all of them, and so we had to pick and choose, and we had to say, okay, I really want to see, I really want to see Dipper, Mabel, Stan, Ford, and 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 even Seuss kind of have a, a sort of an ending um, and, you know, other characters whose sort of um, dimension began to reveal itself in the writing process. Characters like uh, Pacifica or McGucket, who started out completely as one note characters. And then right. we started to find interesting things to do with them. By the time we were sort of finding that with them, you know, clock, cl- uh, the, the, uh-huh. the, the deadline was over. The show was done. Um, so uh-huh. there wasn't an opportunity. Like we didn't write one out because we had a. Mm-hmm hands full with a lot of other stuff to figure out making the finale right. kind of work yeah. um but that that was part of what was so fun about journal three was that like we're like oh ford mcguckett obviously had this giant falling out i want to see a reunion so like right. the bill created an opportunity to see a reunion and, it, and it's bit yeah, it was a beautiful part. it's very yeah. sad um <laughs> but it's like i think in a very subtle way you know ford right. has so much shame for his mistakes and he, he yeah. he's part of his arrogance is that he's been running from confronting that shame. It's like, 
he has to always have a mission in front of him because if he doesn't have a mission in front of him, he's thinking, how have I treated people in my life? <laughs> <laughs> right. You know? Makes sense. And it's like o- only at the end of the journal after, you know, like the threat has been neutralized and he has been humbled for the first time in his entire life. Is he capable of swallowing his pride and going in and talking to McGucket? And he is, he is so floored <laughs> by McGucket's, forgiveness and grace and humility because mcguckett always was a sweet soul and like it it shows a better way to be a person that like he just is like sort of sitting in awe of that and and grateful for it and grateful for the forgiveness which he doesn't think he deserves um and it felt appropriate it felt nice to be able to have a moment of that you know there wasn't room for a lot of it but i I was glad that the journal afforded us the opportunity to to show ford humbled Uh and to show mcguckett like you know it's like Mm -hmm. Ford didn't realize the value of the people in, in around him until until way later in the show. So yeah. Into right. that. I'm having so much trouble picking a last question. So <laughs> I, I know it can be really, I've seen a lot of like panel videos where people go up to like content creators and they go like, or artists and they go, oh, is this character gay? And and it can be really uncomfortable because, you know, you don't want to disappoint anyone. And also like, if they aren't, then it puts them in a bad spot. And also sometimes they're not able to say it. But I want to say that with Ford in particular, with all of the content in the journal about him feeling strange on the outskirts of society, not understood, it resonates so much with like LGBTQ plus fans. At least every everyone I know who is a big Ford fan is some <laughs> some part of the LGBTQ plus community. And, and there's like, you know, there's lines in there about like romance baffling him and stuff like that where we're like we get it we understand it it makes sense it resonates um regardless of whether or not this was intentionally planned when you wrote it like how do you feel about Ford being interpreted as like kind of a bit of a queer icon for so many in the fandom to me the greatest compliment that I can receive as a creator is somebody saying this resonated with me like our goal is to make characters that that are have a human truth in them and that other people when they see the character they say that's me (laughs) Um, and when somebody, you know, says to me, you know, uh, I watched this character and to me, it spoke to my life experience so much. Um, can you confirm or disconfirm (laughs) my interpretation of the character? My feeling is like, you're, like I said, the customer's always right. Like if the character is gay to you, they're gay. Like, you know, like. (laughs) You hear that, guys? Four gay. <laughs> it's like that—that's sort of the magic of fiction. Is like when you read right. a book yeah. that takes place in a kitchen at home. It's yeah. it's you remember the smell of your own parents cooking in that kitchen. Like right, that, yeah. That's the hope. Like if my feeling is, if we do our job, people feel a truth and they connect to it. You know, yeah. in terms of like our sort of intention with these characters, it's like Dipper was very much inspired by me growing up in the 90s um and i was a i was certainly a late bloomer and i was very cerebral and i was very shy and you know the the messages in the media about 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 gender and sexuality and stuff felt very alien and frightening and intimidating to me um and i wasn't very particularly connected to any sort of uh, masculine archetypes in my life because i was not raised with a father in the household so i sort of i came into the world with the influence of my mom and sister, um, you know, I think when it comes to a character like Ford, like Ford was a very challenging character to conceive because he was a main member of the cast that had to enter the show right before it ended. And he had to feel like he fit. And we had spent so much time developing Dipper and Mabel and Stan and Seuss. And then we just had to create Ford in the middle of season two. And that was very difficult. And like I said, it went through a lot of iterations trying to figure out who is this guy? Who is this guy? And we knew his job narratively was to give Stan the biggest chip on his shoulder that we could think of. So we're like, he has to be smarter than Stan. He has to be like fitter and better at fighting than Stan too. Like not like, he's not going to be a little shrinking nerd. Like he actually would, it would be a pretty fair fight between him and Stan because Stan fights dirty, but Ford is is smarter. But I believe that it, I believe that sober Ford would always win in a fight between, I think, drunk uh-huh. Stan. Oh, Stan. <laughs> oh, my God. I think, I think he, he's got, he wants it more. And I think uh-huh. if Ford was a little, a little bit off his focus, Stan could get it. But, you know, <laughs> okay. Ford, Ford has, Ford has trained. 
Ford has <laughs> has like the formal training, you know what I mean? And Stan just has like the madness. <laughs> <laughs> like so so it. Ford was very much us building backwards from like yeah. like in the same way that you 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 know a black hole is there by the light warped around it. It's like you know the damage someone's family has done to them by all of their weird tics and behaviors. <laughs> so it's yeah. like what who is the character who would result in Stan being this hurt and needy and mad and also longing and so we came up with this guy who kind of seems too perfect um <laughs> and it's distant he's aloof and distant and he's too perfect and it's like oh i think he's also aloof and distant from himself i think he is uh deeply deeply hiding from his real feelings about things because at some point early on he decided that he could run from hurt by achievement and by creation and has dug that hole so deep that he has no relationships. He doesn't have friendships. He doesn't have romantic relationships. He is, he is almost like a, like someone, you know, trapped in a tower of his own mind. Um, and I think a character who was that estranged, cause you know, you know, Stan shows that he has romantic interests. Mabel shows that she has romantic interests. Dipper shows that he has romantic interests. Ford shows none of that. He has sublimated himself romantically so, so deeply. Um, and I think for people on all sides of the, you know, uh, the gender and sexuality uh, equation, the idea of, I can't, I'm not sure what this part of myself is. So I'm going to fixate on something I can understand. I am going to become the Guinness world record holder on making Lego recreations <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> of this. And I'm going to get better at it than anything. And if, and as long as I'm doing this, um, then I don't have to focus on that. I, I, it's almost like people speculate about uh, Tesla's sexuality. It's like, there's a lot of people, some people say, cause Tesla was hot and, and yeah. he was lyrical and poetic and mysterious and women they say we're very drawn to Tesla. There's no, Tesla doesn't talk about women. And, and in Tesla's autobiography, he talks about how like women's earrings freak him out. And he hears like playing <laughs> train whistles in his head when he sees like an exposed ankle. Like he was so off in his own plane. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I really thought of Ford kind of like Tesla in that, in that <laughs> realm. He is distant. So it, it doesn't at all surprise me that, that people, people found their own experience reflected through Ford in that way. Um, but it was, you know, when, when we were doing Gravity Falls, like gay marriage, uh, uh, like had only like just been legalized. Like it was before it was, the finale. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it was like, literally like while we were writing the show, you couldn't even get married and be gay in this mm -hmm. country. Like the, the culture has changed so much in such a short amount of time that it's, it's almost hard to remember just how different it was back then. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's okay. Well, let's do the yeah. quick fire round, and then we can we can like finish this yeah. up. Yeah. Um, right. So this is your head cannon. Okay. So we uh, know that the show is over, so this is right. all head cannon. I want to say that because there are people who have written fan fiction and are like, I know what the cannon is, and they'll be mad if you say something that contradicts it. So this is all, all right. just right. your you head it. cannon. Did Ford ever use the cloning copy machine, or was that something that was brought into the Mystery Shack after he left? That's a great question. I think. Gosh, I mean, the thing is, you're the person to ask for questions like that to say, like that <laughs> model of Xerox machine would that have logically existed in the '80s? It if not, would, would have. <laughs> I'm letting you know, I did look into it, okay, and it would um, have. If, but it could also have been just bought by Stan, like the wax statues. Sure. I mean, my, <laughs> I don't, I don't have a strong intuition on that, other than to say that, like. Gravity Falls has a has a natural law of weirdness. It brings it it it, uh, it attracts weird things. So like it it's not hard for for things to wind up in Stan's mm -hmm. hands that have real magical properties because like the the town is doing that. So that's <laughs> how a moron like Stan can wind up with real things some of which are even more impressive than the things that Ford found, which is kind of funny that Ford is like Indiana Jonesing his way across the world, trying to find ancient artifacts and Stan could just be buying them at garage sales because mm -hmm. Gravity Falls wants them, whether whether you're trying or not. Could, okay, so we know that Bill could possess Ford while he was asleep until he got the metal plate in his head, right? Mm -hmm. um, could Ford, was Bill still possessing Ford in the time between him falling through the portal and him getting the metal plate put in his head in Dimension 52 years later? Or did he not know where Ford was so it didn't work? Had, did you ever think about that? Like, was there a, did you have an idea for it? Emotionally, in my understand, in my thought of the story, the way I imagine the story, yeah. um, whatever connection that, that 
Bill was able to create with Ford, where he was able to, you know, ring him up at a moment's notice, pop up in his dream, pop up in his thoughts, uh, you know, offer to possess him to take over his body to do work, that whatever that connection was, was somehow severed or nullified um, by Ford's falling into the nightmare realm and getting lost, that whether it was because of the... Uh, you know, properties of the magic or whether it was because Ford okay. was physically mm -hmm. making his way through the multiverse that, that Bill was not, I don't imagine that in those 30 years, Bill was keeping tabs, poking, like, I think Bill was keep like trying to find Ford. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I, I, I always think of Bill as like this guy who has like, like, you know, he's stirring the pot of soup that is the Ford plan. And he's got <laughs> 900 other pots of soup yeah. across the universe of different things he's working on at every given moment. Uh -huh. He's so cocksure that it's all going to work his way eventually that he's uh -huh. like, you know, and also he's so, you know, Bill's a trillion years old. So it's like Ford disappearing for 30 years is like, is like somebody saying they're ghosting you and then texting you the next weekend. You know? <laughs> got it. Yeah. Like, Ford's uh -huh. going to Ford's going to be back. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> we had such a big fight. Ford's so mad at me. Oh, you know, <laughs> will they, won't they take over the universe relationship? Like he's going to, he's going to march off in a huff and he'll be back. Cause where is Ford going to find anyone else in the multi multiverse that strokes his ego? As well as <laughs> Bill does? Is there anybody else that's going to make Ford feel as important as <laughs> Bill? Oh no, of course wow. not. Ford needs Ooh. validation. And so Bill knows Ford's going to be back eventually. Thank We're gonna so try that. to be respectful of your time. It's twelve oh seven. Yeah, okay. We're sorry for going over. Sorry so about that. <laughs> no, no, no. It's fine. No, I like I said, like I'm I'm a I'm a fan. So when I interact oh. with fans, I, I'm like, that's me. I get it. Um right. like th thank thank you right. for this. This is a lot of fun. No it's problem. it means it means a lot that you care so much that you you found <laughs> these things. I mean, you know, stuff that I haven't thought about in years. It's it's really interesting to to sort of hear about it again, you know, and it's and it's particularly rewarding. Again, I just I can't believe that you know ten years after um, you know releasing uh, Taurus Trapped that anybody even remembers oh. you know like I, I think that is one of the sort of sometimes disconnects between me and the fan community is everyone's like mm -hmm. well of course it's worthy of this level of care and it's like I only know that because you have revealed that to me <laughs> you know? like we know that we tried our best but we had no thought that anyone was going to care <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so yeah. wow. all, all the all the passion is just like to me it's a gift like i don't take any of it for granted i'm i'm you know i'm I'm grateful for it right uh, like i i'm not really as engaged in the fan world these days as i used to be mm -hmm. uh, a because there isn't new gravity falls um and, and right. also B, because just like the i've watched the i've watched the modern fandom culture um, in my lifetime go from barely existent to only being a thing about uh, Joss Whedon message boards to literally taking over all of media consumption to being taken as a given that that mm -hmm. there are certain things that come with making a show. It's like the shows I was watching growing up were like, you know, like Doug and Rugrats, and, and <laughs> there, there were no holy wars about um, whether Chucky e. Finster uh, should uh, be interpreted this way or that way. Like we had no idea the world that was coming into consciousness as right. we were making this thing. Yeah. Um, anyway, I I do uh, yeah. gotta run. Uh, yeah. Yes. A lot of fun. I hope that these answers were satisfying. You know, they I, were great. I, yeah, they were amazing. Like, thank you so much, Alex. This I know that a lot. What people always want is like a really clear yeah. yes, no, hard and fast. And mm -hmm. I I, try I know, understood. Great to meet you both. You too. Uh, thank you for being fans and for keeping the torch alive. Absolutely. All right. Bye. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much, Alex. Bye. Bye. So I got to say that at some point during the interview, and if you read the transcript or if you watch that GFN video, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, Alex actually heard me talk about the timeline a bit. I got to ask him a few specific questions about it. Um, or at least give a few specific details as to what I've discovered during my years of very healthy research into this show's timeline. I showed you the, the fake blood. That was part of a YouTube video called Figuring Out the Gravity Falls Timeline, where the whole bit of the video is that I'm making a conspiracy board and I'm going further and further into insanity. Uh, and by mode. the end of it, I make a deal with Bill so he could tell me the secrets. I don't know how to tell you this. 
but you accidentally made the timeline work in a few places <laughs> and I could tell it was an accident and it's a, <laughs> and, and you are free to tell me no no it was completely intentional but it was an accident I know um and it, stuff like oh man they use a sharpie over here well sharpies were invented in 1964 oh, I'm wow, sure they deep. really <laughs> thought about that you know the fact that in the journal um sorry I'm gonna try not to gush about this for too long but there is a line where Dipper mentions that he saw Stan at his bar mitzvah at age 12 and usually bar mitzvahs are at 13 but occasionally they're at 12 like once every few years if your birthday on the Hebrew calendar comes before your birthday on the Gregorian calendar which isn't very common it usually comes after your birthday on the Gregorian calendar so given that they were like between 8 and 13 and 1960 something there is only one year that works out where they could have like had their bar mitzvah at 12 and it's 1951 and it works because it means that they would be in high school when Nixon was president and because it's a Nixon's portrait and it also works because it means that they would be like around 10 11 12 when they discovered the Stan war which is 1964 and they would have the sharpie and it does work because of like a million things that just happen to fall into place it was a great video i had fun making it um it sounds like it, a great video it sounds like you were able to extract so yeah. much content from something yeah. that was free yeah. from content you yeah. found new content hidden in between the letters there's yeah. secret content in there it, it sounds like an entertaining video it sounds like you did oh, your it was deal. a lot of fun to watch you know, i mean it, it's cool that well i think it's cool first of all it sounds like funny and engaging and it sounds like you had a good time making it and like that's I what we it was want. so cool like, i loved it we, we want the show to be an invitation to yeah. other people to like create right yeah. um right. but I, I think it, it's interesting because it's like it sounds like in the process of trying to sort of decode what was in the text yeah. you discovered yeah sometimes things that we like did intend and put together but also discovered the degree to which like um, it's an accident <laughs> <laughs> the degree to which like th there was that there was that famous case you sound like you might know about this um where somebody had said that they had like proven that like um that like lewis carroll was jack the ripper based on alice yeah. in Wonderland. um and yeah. then somebody else pointed out like i can circle pay I can circle sentences in the Bible that prove that God is Jack the Ripper. I can, <laughs> I can circle sentences in, yeah. uh, you know, oh, the places you'll go that prove that Dr. Seuss was Jack the Ripper or whatever. Yeah. That, like, you know, like the Texas sharpshooter fallacy of like he, the human mind is a pattern seeking machine, right? Mm -hmm. We're so good at seeking patterns. <laughs> And we will see God's face in the random shape of the clouds and 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 then we'll paint a beautiful painting. And now the painting is real. So mm -hmm. like the interpretation is real. The art is real. Um, like, but it, it's a fascinating thing making Gravity Falls where we like, yeah, we hit a couple of mysteries and we worked hard on them and we were proud of them. Um, but we invited people to keep looking um, mm -hmm. and people would find stuff that would be extraordinary and it would be so much smarter than anything we ever thought of. Um, and it would fit. <laughs> the one of the things that holds the timeline together is that the portal incident had to happen in 1983. And we know this because Ford mentions the Eurythmics on a page and the song oh, yeah, Sweet Dreams right. Are Made of This came out in early 1983. Uh, and, and so it's one of those things where this is this is the final piece of the puzzle. Um, and, and, and there's a part of the timeline video where I'm like, oh man, maybe I was overthinking this. It doesn't make sense. I have no proof it happened in 1983. And then I remember, the, I say something like, there go my sweet dreams of figuring out the timeline. Wait! <laughs> and, and it's, it sounds like a very high production. Uh, uh... It, it was. <laughs> it no, was here's, what, here's what I respect about what you're saying is when we made Journal 3, like, uh -huh. you're like, how do we make, we're going to make a monster manual, essentially. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like right. monster manual. It, it's yeah. a 300 pages of look at this monster. And then there was a question of like, how do I make a monster manual? A monster manual is fun, but yeah. how do I make it like worth reading? Mm -hmm. It's like, can I string narrative through the monster manual? And it sounds yeah. like you've done all this like research and you're like, I want to create a piece of art about this, but how do I make this a story? And so like in the same way that we were stringing narrative through our monster manual, you were mm -hmm. stringing narrative through your own descent into uh, madness. Yeah. <laughs> and making yourself a character of the story. It, yeah, yeah. Hence, 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 hence the fake blood. <laughs> it was, it was great. 
Um, I, I will say what you're saying. I think what you're saying is that if if, if I ever no, make another journal or, or Gravity Falls thing, I need to put like five intentionally completely wrong things in the timeline just to give you something to go crazy. <laughs> do that just to torture you. I just a joke in there that you did it specifically to torture me. So it would be in the well, now that we've I, met. Now that we've met, <laughs> you won't know if I did or didn't. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> he actually complimented the format that I chose to make my timeline video in based on what he heard of it. Um, that's that's really cool. That's amazing. That's mind blowing to me. But there is something else I'm gonna remember just a little bit more. You see, I have a Gravity Falls tattoo, and at the very beginning of the interview, actually before we began the interview, so this isn't part of the transcript. Um, I was gushing to Alex about um, how much of a fan I was of the show and I mentioned that I had the tattoo of the line on the My Muse Was a Monster page from Journal 3. A line written in code that says, if Icarus could see me now. Well, yeah, yeah, we can... it'll, it'll, uh, while we're talking, Ooh. it'll afford oh. he's standing <laughs> on the sun. He's saying, <laughs> if only Icarus could see me now. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> that was the coolest thing to ever happen to me. So, Alex, I don't know if you're watching this. You're probably busy being, I don't know, an institution in the world of animation. Just an absolute monument to cartoons and what cartoons can be. But if you are watching this by any chance, thank you very much for your time. This was unbelievably cool. And I hope... You don't think I'm too weird for making puppets. I know that there is literally a character in the show who is made fun of for being the weird puppet guy. I, I'm not trying to be Gabe Benson. I just thought it'd be funny. <laughs> so yes, I need to thank Alex. I especially need to thank that GF fan for bringing me on to this project in the first place. Seriously, I haven't known that GF fan very long, but he's been nothing but kind to me since I've known him and just unbelievably helpful throughout this entire process. And if you're watching this, thank you very much. This has been the coolest thing I've ever done. What am I going to do with this? I have, a, I just have a plaid picture of right now. What am I going to do with this? If you'd like to support me, my weird, strange art, my very odd videos, my obsession with Gravity Falls, and the work that I put into my videos, please check out my Patreon linked down below. And on that note, this is Hannah, signing off. Oh, I'm interviewing Rob Renzetti. That video's coming out soon.